Good morning to all in the Cornerstone Church family. I hope you've been keeping safe and well in lockdown this week and a particularly warm welcome if you're new to joining us. Well, it's a pleasure to be watching this online service knowing that others are also doing the same. We are united together in Christ as a church, as a church family, despite the fact we cannot all meet together in person right now. And we know from the Bible that we are all valuable and precious to God, who knows each one of us better than we know ourselves. He is our Heavenly Father and we are his dearly loved children. For those who trust in Christ, we have all received the ultimate blessing, forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of his grace. With this wonderful news fresh in our hearts and minds, let's come to the Lord God in prayer. Open our lips that our mouths may tell your praise. Open our ears to obey your word. Open our hearts to love you and walk in your ways. Amen. Well, a little bit later on, our pastor, the Reverend John Parker, will be preaching for us as we continue in our three-week series in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesian Church. But before that, let's sing our first song, followed by our children's song. Oh, Lord. 
bring glory to your name. May all my days bring glory to your Well, this term in our children's slots, we're answering the question, what is church for? And today we're finding out that church is a body. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, it says this. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is part of it. Now, I need your help to make sure we all understand what this means. Can you help me? Great. So first off, start by putting your hands on your head. Thank you. And now leave them there while we think about the head of the body. So this verse is saying that church is like a body. And the first thing to understand is that Jesus Christ is the head. We can't do anything without him. He is the boss. He gives the instructions. What he says and wants to happen, happens. The church is like a body and Jesus is the head. Have you still got your hands on your head? Well done. Next, I want you to choose a different body part and wiggle it around. It might be your elbow or your fingers or even your shoulders. Show me what you've chosen. Great, some really good choices and all different. Well, our verse this morning says that we are all like different parts of a body, but the same body. So, although we can all invite our friends to church or to watch our services, some of us are particularly good at it. That's one part the body needs, people who are great at bringing lots of friends to church. We can all sing, but some of us are particularly good at it. And when we can meet together in person, they will help us in our singing so that we know when to come in. We're all friendly people, but some people are particularly good at speaking to those they've just met and making them feel welcome. That's another part the body needs, people who are particularly good at welcoming others. We can all read the Bible, but there are some who are particularly good at understanding it and teaching it to others. We are all one body. We're just different parts. If we were all good at the same thing, it would be a bit like having a body with just a shoulder. It would be really impossible for that body to function. We need all the different parts. If one part is missing, it won't work very well. If you didn't have a foot, you'd fall over. So no one can say to the other body parts, we don't need you. We all have to play a part in making the body work. So if you're here today, no matter how old you are, God has put you here with us to be part of the body. If you haven't worked out what part you are yet and how to serve the body, then maybe you could ask some friends or your parents this week, what am I good at? What could I do more of? You could also ask, what should I do less of? Because if there are other people who do that thing well, you can focus on the thing that you're particularly good at, which no one else is doing. Now I'm going to pray that we learn to serve Jesus Christ and the rest of the body together. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you that each one of us has a part to play in the body. Thank you that we are all valuable and we are all needed there is no waste in your body. We pray, Father, that we would help each other to see how we can serve your body, the church, and Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Before the world began, God made a master plan. To bring all things together under one head That head is Jesus Christ Who died and rose to life And now he's seated at the right hand of God Once we were dead in sin Now we are raised with him By grace we're saved through faith in Jesus alone 
Your activity this week is to make a body. You might want to use Play-Doh or Lego, or you might even have paper big enough to draw around your own body. Either way, I look forward to seeing what you make at our Zoom catch up a bit later. Have fun. Thanks, Hannah. Well, whatever joys and challenges we are experiencing in this latest lockdown, I always find it helpful to be reminded that God is sovereign and that nothing is beyond his control. There is no part of creation, including every detail of our lives, which comes as a surprise to God. I don't know about you, but if you're feeling anything like I am, nothing about 2020 has been particularly easy so far. I've felt very weak and have been reminded very regularly of my need to rely on God. Yet in everything, the Spirit helps us to give strength and also interceding to God our Father in our weakness, in accordance with his perfect will. Perhaps we can very evidently see the Holy Spirit helping us every day. It might be that as we go through our lives, we don't feel the Holy Spirit is with us. But that's not the reality of the situation. In our Bible reading now, and in the sermon to follow, we're going to learn a bit more about the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, with God the Father and Jesus the Son. The Bible reading today is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 to 14. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Welcome. Thank you for joining us again as we listen to God's word uh, through the Bible. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you and praise you that you speak to us by your Holy Spirit as we read the words of this book, as we hear them explained. And we pray, Lord, that you might open our eyes so that we might see Jesus Christ, trust in him, hope in him, love him. Amen. Well, are you possessed? By which I don't mean in the horror film sense, you know, you're possessed by some evil spirit or some kind of monster like uh, Barty Crouch in Harry Potter or Harry Potter himself or most of the cast of Alien. No, I mean, are you possessed by God? Does God live in you? Has he brought you to life? Is his life in you? Are you a place where the Holy Spirit dwells? And you might say, well, well, how do we know? The Christian life is described in three words, faith, love and hope in the pages of the New Testament. It's like a sort of summary. Christians are people who have faith in Jesus Christ. Christians are people who love Jesus Christ, and worship him. And Christians are people who have hope. In Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the future that we hope in and this morning we're particularly going to be thinking about Christian hope. Last week we looked at the lavish love of God choosing Christians since before the foundation of the world. A Christian is someone who has every blessing in Christ in the heavenly places and today Paul continues to explain to the Christians in Ephesus why they are to be full of praise of God. Yes, they're to praise God's glorious grace, 
or praise him for his glorious grace, but they're also to praise him for his glory in the secure future that a Christian has, the sure hope that a Christian has. Hope is something that people live for, isn't it? It's, it's very difficult to live without hope. Eddie Jacko, uh, a Holocaust survivor, told of how he survived seven years in two concentration camps. He survived by having hope. He said that the reason why people died or committed suicide was because they lost hope. And he resolved to be the kindest man he could be when he was released. So to defeat the hatred of his captors with his love and he's reached the age of a hundred and his last chapter of the book that he's written is what I share is not my pain what I share is my hope we all live because we have hope maybe we hope for wealth or health or the future life we dream of a promotion um, a wonderful relationship an end to illness and ideologies can prey on this need for hope can't they as we were looking at a couple of weeks ago in the 20th century ideologies like communism preyed on people's hope it produced the delusion of a utopia on earth the new man and, and fascism similarly preyed on people's desires for this new era a new nation a perfect nation a perfect race worth sacrificing everything for what a cruel hope so we can hope for the wrong things but today people are more likely to embrace a dystopian view of the future aren't they because of the cynicism and disillusionment in our culture let's sleep together now because tomorrow might never come it's celebrated in our pop music it's a philosophy of life that has an ancient pedigree but seems to have been dreamt up by a teenage boy, in my view. The world might end because of global catastrophe or a global pandemic. Oh, look, it's happening. Eat, drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Maximise pleasure, there is no tomorrow. Well, you see, these are all delusions, powerful lies. The reality that Jesus taught was that whether we like it or not, people are heading into an eternal world, eternal life or eternal death, heaven or hell. And wonderfully, a Christian, and this is our first point, can praise God for the certain hope of inheritance in Christ. A Christian can praise God for the certain hope of inheritance in Christ. Paul continues his subject of praise in verse 11. In him, that's in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. See, he's explaining to the Ephesian church that Christians have obtained an inheritance. And by inheritance, Paul means heaven or the new creation that eternal life. And to obtain an inheritance sounds like it's something a Christian has achieved, but nothing could be further from the truth. The the verb tense means it is completed and it has been done for Christians. It's an aorist passive for those of you who are interested. We might translate it literally like this. Christians have been inheritanced by God. Of course, we don't have a verb to inheritance, but we've received an inheritance might be a a better way of putting it. It's an inheritance that's been given to us. And Paul is clear that Christians have received an inheritance by being predestined, chosen since before the foundation of the world. That's how we, he expressed it as we thought about last week. We've received an inheritance by being predestined to it according to God's purpose. The purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. He he energises this in us. We can be sure that we have this inheritance if we're Christians this morning. 
And why has he done this? Why has God planned it this way? So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. See, God will be shown to be wonderfully glorious through the people he's predestined to, to receive this inheritance. Now, Paul could mean the Jews who first hoped in Christ, the apostles and the early disciples, or he could be writing this letter to uh, the Ephesian church, um, looking back on, on all those in Ephesus who believed at the beginning when Paul visited Ephesus. But either way, a Christian has obtained this inheritance for the praise of God's glory. The fact that a Christian has been chosen since before the foundation of the world has been given an inheritance at the end of the world from beginning to end, chosen by God's will and purpose in eternity, shows God to be the wonderfully generous, loving, powerful God that he really is. It's a bit like the glory of God, like the sun. It is reflected by a mirror or, or split into the colours of the spectrum by a prism. The, the, the glass prism and the mirror are there to show the varied glory and wonder of sunlight. Christians exist to show the wonderful glory of God. Just how loving and generous and kind and powerful he is in reality to the praise of his glory. That's what we're to do. So if we're a Christian here this morning, we're to praise God for the hope of inheritance that we have in Christ. It's a, it's a sure hope. But that's not how people think, is it? People think that an, an inheritance can somehow be in doubt. I mean, we, we see this in our films. In the film Knives Out, it tells the story of a wealthy man deciding who will get his millions. And the house and the, the gathering of the vultures of his family uh, care nothing for him. They just want his money in his house. And the person who ends up inheriting everything is his carer, the one who actually cared for him. See, some of us, when it comes to this inheritance of heaven, of the new heavens and the new earth, the new creation, may get nothing because we've not trusted in Jesus Christ. Some of us may think that we're favoured, that, that we're going to inherit the house or the millions, that we're going to be there in heaven, even though we're not Christians. I, I hear this all the time as I meet with bereaved friends and, and family, many of whom are not Christians, talking about their, their dear relative who has died really wasn't a Christian, had no interest in Jesus Christ, but they think somehow they will get the inheritance. You know, people can be very, very positive in some ways that, well, they're going to go to heaven. Perhaps they think that they're good people or just everybody goes there. Neither of which are the qualifications of going to heaven. No. Some people are going to get an awful shock when those who inherit what God has planned for his people, when, when that inheritance is read out. But also as Christians, sometimes we can doubt, can't we, that we will get the inheritance. See, an inheritance only happens when a death has occurred. And in this case, it is the death of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died to take the punishment for people like you and me. But that only benefits us if we trust in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's only those who are born into his family who get the inheritance. Only those who have a relationship with him inherit with him. See, we can have false hopes of inheritance, as if believing in Jesus is not related to it, or false doubts that we will inherit it. But when we do believe in Jesus, we get the inheritance. Paul goes on to explain, and this is our second point, praise God for the sealing of the Holy Spirit in Christ. Praise God for the sealing of the Holy Spirit in Christ. 
See, as he writes to the Ephesian church, he reminds them when they inherited this inheritance, and it was in Christ. Verse 13, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. See, when did the Christians receive this inheritance? Well, they heard the gospel. They, they heard the word of truth, just, just like we're doing this morning. See, when they heard the word of truth, the gospel of their salvation, what, what happened? They believed. In him, they believed in Jesus Christ. They entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ. They trusted in him. They gave up on living life for themselves and they put the whole weight of their futures into the hands of Jesus Christ. They called him Lord and God. So when Paul or others had proclaimed the gospel to them, they believed in Jesus Christ and then something happened as they believed in Jesus Christ. Let's look. At verse 13 again, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. What does that mean? See, for us, the idea of sealing may be a little bit confusing. We might think of sealants and sealant guns, you know, sealing gaps. It's not that. In, in the ancient world, a, a seal showed who owned something. See, often the, the seal would be pressed into to wet clay and, and then baked hard and then used as a tag to show who owned that thing. Or it was a seal which carried all the authority and weight of office impressed into wax, put on letters. Well, we're perhaps a bit more familiar with that. It showed who owned something, who had authority. And what Paul is saying is, when somebody believes in Jesus Christ, they receive the promised Holy Spirit, who is a seal from God. God is in effect saying to that person, by giving them the Holy Spirit, you belong to me, you are mine. You are my possession. I possess you. I don't know what your most treasured possession is. For me, it's uh, probably the uh, photographs of the family or one of my fishing rods. I'm not going to plump for one or the other because that would betray way too much. But I'm keen to keep them safe. I I've got so many copies of family photos on various computers that, that I'm pretty sure um, we're not going to lose them. And my fishing rod, my favourite fishing rod, is hidden away somewhere. Well, what is your treasured possession? Whatever it is, you want to keep it safe, don't you? What Paul is saying here is that Christians are God's treasured possession. We are sealed. He owns us. He indwells us by his Holy Spirit. We belong to him. His ownership is imprinted on us, in us. And this happens when we believe in Jesus Christ, when he becomes our King, our Lord and our God, our Saviour. See, when we trust in the one who rescues us from punishment of sin, we're declared innocent. When we trust in the one who is the life, we are given eternal life. When we trust in the one who is the righteousness of God, the only perfect human being who's fully obeyed God, we are given his righteousness and we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, God himself. And this is a sign where God will do all in his power to ensure that we are not lost, that we will inherit we have obtained we've been inheritanced now we have it and the holy spirit shows us but well, how how does the holy spirit show us well paul continues you were sealed with the promised holy spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance 
he's the deposit that guarantees our inheritance or uh, and then literally into the redemption of possession esv goes with until we acquire possession of it but it's ambiguous it could equally mean until the rescue into possession and it's left ambiguous as to whether we possess the inheritance or god possesses us as his inheritance so it could be that the holy spirit is the guarantee that we will inherit or and some commentators go with this more likely God fully possesses us. Both speak of the security that a Christian has, that they will be in heaven, that they will have eternal life in the new creation, that they will see Jesus Christ. God has put his authority on it. God has possessed us to the praise of his glory. We all know what a guarantee is, but often they're not worth the paper they're written on, are they? And the, the emphasis in this um, idea of guarantee is more on a, a, a deposit that guarantees, like, like we might put down a deposit on a house purchase that guarantees the purchase. God has put down a deposit of himself the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. He has invested himself in us. He possesses us to guarantee to us that we will be in heaven. Jesus expressed it like this, that, that we as his sheep hear his voice and follow him and that no one can snatch us out of his hand. No one can snatch us out of our father's hand. We are safe. We have inheritance. So praise God for this, the certainty of the inheritance that you have. If you're a Christian, that we have this inheritance and the Holy Spirit being given to us is a guarantee, a deposit, a seal of ownership, a seal of authority over us. But we might say, but John, I still sin. Yes, I still sin. We all still sin. But that doesn't stop God's plan from the foundation of the world from getting us to the final goal of seeing Jesus, of being like Jesus, of being holy and blameless like we were thinking about last week. And we might say, well, I don't seem to reach the standard that other Christians said. I'm not as godly as they are. But that doesn't affect what God has planned for us and God will achieve for us. We belong to God. We are his possession. We might say, well, I'm not as gifted as other Christians. I, I, I doubt that I have the Holy Spirit. Well, no, everyone who believes in Jesus Christ is sealed by the Holy Spirit so that all Christians can live to the praise of his glory. We're like little trophies, billions of little trophies of God's love and goodness and power who reflect back to him and to the whole universe the glory of his blood-bought love for us he loves us to death literally to death on a cross will he send his son to the cross to pay the price for our sin to buy us back for him and then suddenly somehow give up on us no it would be to the opposite of the praise of his glory it would, it would be the opposite of a demonstration of his power and love for him to let go of us no we are objects of his mercy. Little reflections that show the power, the undeserved nature of his love for us. Billions of sparkling diamonds, carbon now, but in the future, unchanging glory. Now, if we're not Christians, we might say, but that, that sounds great for other people. How could this happen? for me well in the same way that it happened for the ephesians they were steeped in magic in sexual immorality in hatred in idolatry yet when the, they heard the word of truth the good news that we proclaim every sunday at cornerstone they were saved they were saved from hell for heaven they were saved from god's just wrath 
for being innocent in God's sight. They were saved from death to be brought to new life. They were saved from insecurity and false hopes for a sure hope, the inheritance that God has promised to all who love him, to all who trust in him. See, as Christians, the security of our inheritance sets us free to praise God to God and, and to others, doesn't it? See, if today we inherited a billion pounds, would, be as, would we be as anxious about our finances? If today we inherited new bodies, would we be as anxious about our ill health? If today we inherited wisdom and knowledge that meant our minds would be raised to genius level, would we be as anxious about what we need to learn for our studies or how we understand the world? If today we inherited relationships that are perfect with God and with other people, would we be as anxious about the difficulties in our relationships? If today we inherited a life that cannot be destroyed, would we be as anxious about our own death? Well, you know the answer. In Christ, we have inherited more than all those things. And it's secure. What Paul is saying is if we're Christians here this morning, we already have all these things. God has given us a guarantee, a deposit that we will inherit the Holy Spirit. We are his possession. We are possessed by God, the Holy Spirit. That's what every Christian enjoys. So, so can we see what a wrong thing it is to suggest that Christians do not necessarily have the Holy Spirit at all? That it's possible to believe in Jesus Christ and not have the Holy Spirit? No. Once we become Christians, we have the Holy Spirit because he's the guarantee that he is a deposit that guarantees our inheritance. Sure, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can resist his influence in our lives. We can wander away from God, but we can never lose the Holy Spirit. That would bring shame to God. And God, his whole plan for the whole universe is for the glory of God. And it's on the glory of God, his commitment, right, good, holy, loving, just commitment to glorify that which is right, good and loving in the universe, namely himself, never to be deflected from that, that means that our salvation is secure, our inheritance is secure. We have the seal of God's ownership. A Christian, wonderful, is possessed by God because we are God's possession. Which means we can look forward to being with Jesus in heaven. It means our hearts are directed heavenwards. It means to live is Christ and to die is gain. It means our hearts are storing up treasures not for this world, but in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. It means that we long to be unclothed from this body with all its pain and all the temptations that arise through it. And we can be clothed with our resurrection body. We can look forward to that. It means that we're exiles in this world, which is passing through setting our hearts on things above where Christ is, setting our hearts on that day when we'll see him face to face and we will be like him because we will see him as he is. See, a Christian is possessed by God, the Holy Spirit, because a Christian is the treasured possession of God. And because we have the Holy Spirit, we have a hope, a living inside us, hope. We're looking forward to the new world. We're looking forward to the home of righteousness. We're aware of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. A Christian is possessed by God because a Christian is the treasured possession of God. And who wouldn't want that? Do you want that? If we want that, we need to stop putting our hope in the small things of this world. We need to turn away from those mini hopes and we need to trust in Jesus Christ, maybe for the first time. As we turn away from the small and often puny, putrid hopes that we have for this world and turn to Jesus Christ, 
Well, then we're promised forgiveness. We're promised the Holy Spirit by God. We're promised that if we do that, we will be his treasured possession. We will be possessed by God. We'll be on the road to a glorious future. We have hope. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you so much that you have sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world to give us a sure hope of heaven, a sure hope of an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for us, and that whatever we face in this life, we will always be possessed by you and you will ensure that we are there with you in heavenly glory as your treasured possessions. Lord, please strengthen this hope in us that we might be more useful in this world, praising you to you and praising you to others. And we pray this for the glory of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, John. Salvation through Jesus' death on the cross, sealed with the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, is the greatest gift that any of us could ever receive. Though our sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow, washed clean by Jesus' blood shed for us. Let's confess our sins together now, the very sins that mean Jesus' sacrifice was necessary and the very sins that Jesus' sacrifice was a complete atonement for. Let's join in these words together now. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and confess our many sins, which we have committed by thought, word and deed against your divine majesty, provoking your wrath and indignation against us. We earnestly repent. We are truly sorry for all our misdoings. The memory of them grieves us. The burden of them is more than we can bear. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that from now on we may always serve and please you in lives wholly renewed by your Spirit, to the honour and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God is slow to anger and full of compassion. He forgives all who humbly repent and trust in his Son as Saviour and Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, sealed by the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's carry on in a time of prayer together now, starting with the collect, the set prayer for today, and then the Lord's Prayer and then into our prayers of intercession for our world. Stir up the wills of your faithful people, Lord, so that we may produce abundantly the fruit of good works and receive your abundant reward. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let's take some time now to talk to our Heavenly Father. It's amazing to think that we can 
approach the creator of the universe and that he's ready to listen to us that he's interested in the things that matter to us and he just wants to hear our prayers and in his great wisdom and out of his love he will answer them so let's pray together now when i say lord in your mercy you could join in with hear our prayer father god we want to thank you that in jesus you have given us a sure and certain hope of the world to come we thank you that we are your possession that you keep us safe through the holy spirit as we um, go on our way towards meeting you one day in heaven please help us to be confident of everything that we have in christ the security that we can have in him and the many blessings that we can know lord in your mercy hear our prayer dear father we pray for those in colchester who do not know this security may they come to hear of the wonderful rescue that you have achieved through your son the lord jesus christ we pray that there would be many who believe in him this christmas Please equip all faithful churches to bring the hope of the gospel to people who do not have hope. And for those who think there's nothing when they die, please show them the truth of the spiritual world, the eternal world, so that they may seek you. And please will you strengthen us to reach out with the gospel this Christmas. May many people hear the good news of Jesus through the plans that we're making and we pray that you would bring salvation through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we finally pray now for our nation and for the world at this time of this global pandemic. We do thank you for the vaccines that have been developed and the scientists who've worked to develop them. Thank you for the gifts and the expertise that you've given those scientists. We continue to pray that many uh, may be caused to reflect on their mortality and to seek Christ. We pray for wisdom for the government as they consider the right thing to do at the end of lockdown with the possibility of Christmas being celebrated. Please give their advisors wisdom and the willingness to consider all the information available to them and that their decisions won't be politically motivated but wise decisions. Lord, you know our longing for a safe and joyful Christmas celebration and so we, we put these hopes uh, in your hands and ask that you help us to trust you with whatever the outcome is. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, Father, that we've been able to talk to you. We thank you that you hear us. We thank you that you answer. And we bring all these prayers, trusting in the Lord Jesus, in his name. Amen.
justice has been satisfied.
It's been great that you've joined us for this week's service. Thank you. Whilst it's really helpful that we can use technology in this way, we know it's still not the same as meeting together in person. So we need to work um, hard and keep a strong commitment to the relational aspects of being a church family too. And an important part of this is our Zoom coffee and chat, which follows this service. If you've not been to one before and would like a chance to know more about it, it's just a chance to have a catch up about how our week has been in general and to discuss any particular aspects of the service we've just watched that were encouraging or maybe we have questions about. Um, it doesn't matter if you join us 10 minutes in or if your child wants to get a close up look of the screen so suddenly shows us all the inner workings of their left nostril, it doesn't matter. Actually, we really enjoy seeing what the children have been doing in their activities each week um, or finding out what they've been playing with. Um, anyway, if, if you'd like an invite, and then please do drop us an email and the address will come up at the end of the service. And if you'd like to help us build our online profile so more people can find us and tune into our services, then please subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the thumbs up button under the videos you watch. Let's finish our service with a prayer. We thank you, God our Father, for the grace and peace you show us through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your church here and the unity we share as brothers and sisters. May our faith grow more and more and our love for you and one another increase. Please help us to be individuals and a church who know the reality of the presence of the Holy Spirit with us, strengthening and guiding us in all we do and say. And we ask all this for your glory and for our good. Amen. Take care and see you soon.